You're listening to Healing Voices Project, where we share stories and the latest information from people who fight addiction every day. I'm Mike Torvelt, your host and author of Voices from the Fallen. Thank you for listening, for following, and most of all, for sharing with people you care about. Make your voice count too. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Torville, host of Healing Voices Project. We're glad to have you here with us today. And I've been looking forward to this conversation uh, with Paul McNeil and Catherine Mulcahy. Is that correct? Thanks, guys, (laughs) girls. (laughs) Thanks, both of you, for joining us today. Um, And Paul is the uh, program coordinator um, of the CLOSE program. It's CLOSE Community. Um, which is a, a, an organization in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. And I've been really impressed with, with all that you've got going on. And um, so, it, Paul, you've been with a close community now for since its genesis about seven years ago? Yeah, I jumped in, I want to say, six months into the coalition really started to form when mm-hmm. they, they finally got funded, funding, okay. federal funding from the... Mm-hmm. It's now the CDC. Originally it was... Uh, um, the Substance Addiction Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, they got a f- five-year grant, and then they had to bring on a full-time staff to like manage the grant, and that's when uh, <laughs> just a mosquito. Oh, um, and uh, that's when they brought me in. So I was maybe six months after the coalition really started to uh, come together, and they had they were building a lot of steam, and then. Uh, they hired me in November of 2017. So you were the first program was the coordinator. First staff member. First staff and only. Member. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm the only one they've had since. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Something yeah. must be going right. Oh, a lot of, yeah, a lot of great work. A, yeah. lot, of, a lot of right. Yeah. Well, that's great. And also, um, Catherine Mulcahy, who is now a college student, but you've been involved with the close community for a few years now yourself, right? Mm hmm. Now, how did you get involved with it? Yeah. I've been, I started when I was, I was a freshman in yeah, high school, ninth grader. Yeah, ninth grader. Um, and I, well, I joined a, uh, a club. It was called SAD. No, it was called Stand. So students, students together against negative decisions. Um, so I joined that, and then that kind of, they kind of worked together with Close a lot of the time. We went to Washington D.C. for a CADCA event, which mm-hmm. I don't even. CADCA is the Community Anti Drug Coalitions <laughs> of America, and it's the national training arm for this particular grant so like any technical assistance or training or uh they have this contract with this huge international prevention organization called CADCA the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions America and they have a conference every February called the annual forum and I mean you know 2,000 plus people come together all prevention coalition people from all over the world Mostly uh, the U.S., but people from different countries will show up to learn about prevention, and especially drug trafficking and, and mm-hmm. prevention in that world. And, yeah, we, we have the opportunity to bring student leaders every year with us to this conference. And there's a youth leadership track of the conference. And Catherine's been twice yeah, on-site and, twice and, one and online. then virtual during COVID. Yeah, so that first time yeah. went, is when I – well, I met you before, but yeah. when I first got to we know you. We spent, like, a whole week with the whole group, mm-hmm, yeah, the youth mm-hmm. group. Wow. Yeah. That's great. You travel a lot, don't you? <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, now I do. <laughs> Did you just get back from a trip? Yep. Uh, I just got back from Thailand yesterday. Um, just for so the pleasure? For the heck of it? Just for, yeah. We met, yeah. my friend and I went, we met a girl, um, we knew a girl from UMass that lives there, mm-hmm. so we met her there. We went to go stay with her at nice. her house. So nice. it was wicked fun. How long have you been back now? Just, <laughs> just, just less than a day. Less, less so than a day. So are, you, are you still in the fuzziness I, of... Uh, I'm okay. We, I woke up, I woke up at like... 4 30 this morning i'm like oh like that but yeah. like maybe you go to bed sleep. at 4 30 this afternoon yeah. then as a Perhaps. result don't yeah. do it Kat. <laughs> <laughs> stay, up, stay up till nine you can do it <laughs> well i'm going to tell you i was on the and i'm learning more about the close community and there's so much to it i got to give you an immense amount of credit because one your program is, is great and it's been so effective but your website really has a lot of information on there and there's about parents uh, teens in the community different resources you have and you've been developing this for a long time certainly um i mean this is one of the better programs i've seen around it's fantastic 
Well, thanks, Mike. Sure. <laughs> thanks for having us. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but tell us a little bit more, elaborate. What is it that you actually do? And by the way, we'll mention the website. It's Close Community. Dot org, mm -hmm. right? Um, but let's talk about a little bit about what what is this purpose and what do you do and and what how often do you meet and and what do you do at the meetings and what are you accomplishing? A lot there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm going to start with all of the questions. All right. And yeah. uh, I think what we're trying to do as a coalition is create Catherine Mulcahy pathways, mm -hmm. which is essentially, you know, and Catherine can speak to this from her personal experience, but um, I, I, I think the community really came together because they saw that Longmeadow was creating this environment where a lot of young people were falling through the cracks and there were some local conditions that were specific to Longmeadow with this sort of high stress, high pressure, these really high academic expectations, these um, really high pressure uh, athletic expectations. There was just a lot of pressure, pressure cooker and a lot of stressors, um, a lot of like financial expectations too. You know, there's there's it's a pretty affluent community, and um, but then there's some kids who come from families that aren't super affluent, and so there's that pressure of like we're the poor kids in a rich town, and there, there's this interesting mix of 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 white kids essentially. I mean, there, there's there, it's a little more diverse now than it was seven years ago, but it's it's still predominantly uh, white identifying students, and they. Uh, it's it's it can be a pressure cooker, and so what happens with those root causes and local conditions is there's a lot of self medicating, a lot of you know self soothing uh, instead of you know healthy coping skills and stress management. People are using alcohol on the weekends, you know, pretty considerable amounts of alcohol, and so that we had saw that high alcohol rates and earlier uh, introduction to prescription medication misuse, um, and then that leading to the much more affordable heroin use. You know, between the ages of 18 to 22, there was a lot of students uh, heading that way and so yeah seven years ago I mean, there was just there was enough overdoses and deaths where they they came together as a community said so we need to do something very concerted very organized to address this issue and the beautiful thing about the funding that they went for is that it it requires you to have 12 sectors at the table regularly meeting regularly planning regularly carrying out evidence-based strategies uh, sectors everything from uh, the youth sector, schools, law enforcement, business, faith-based organizations, um, you know, 12 different sectors representing the community at large, uh, working on the issue together, you know, moving forward together, many different opinions, perspectives, and stories sort of driving the work. And the biggest goal of the coalition's work is to, it's to not work uh, directly in direct service with young people, but it's to change the environment that all of the young people are universally growing up in in that town. So, like, for example, if it's really easy to go walk into one uh, corner store and get alcohol at the age of 18, um, that's an environmental factor that if you can change that, that will dramatically shift how normal it is for young people to access alcohol mm -hmm. in a retail outlet. So um, you change the environment, you change behaviors, and you change, you know, long-term healthy outcomes for young people. And so that they really come together in many different facets of changing the environment. So d taking a little bit of stress off of the expectations that every kid is exceptional and gonna go to Harvard or Yale, because that's, it, extraordinary doesn't work if everyone's extraordinary. I, you know, it's not something that a lot of parents are struggling with, so there's that pressure there. But there's also a lot of skills that young people can develop uh, starting early elementary school with um, these evidence-based curricula that we use through the Botvin Life Skills Program, which is helping young people develop uh, social emotional skills, self-soothing skills, stress management skills, uh, peer support skills, coping skills, all these, you know, delayed gratification, all these skills that we know if you can build them when you're young, later on in life, when you're, you know, in a position where, oh, I can go to this party and binge drink, or I can do this thing with my friends and this sort of alternative above the influence substance free activity, you have that skill set to fall back on and develop these refusal skills or coping skills to make healthier choices. So we're trying to make healthy choices the easier choices. And so that's a lot of work and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of people creatively coming together and, and doing that. So yeah, that's the work of our coalition, and changing the environment that young people grow And you're up getting in. some great feedback from the community in Longmeadow. When you have your meetings, 
um, I think you meet quarterly. We do, yep. We have yep. A, an open meeting. Everyone can come. We try to televise it on Longmeadow Community Television okay. every three months. Uh, and then we have our, our board meetings where we plan those meetings uh, a week or two before that open meeting. Yeah. Do you think the program has been effective over the last seven years? Uh, when we look at the data, yeah. yeah. So we okay. look at 30-day substance use. We have a bunch of core measures that we look at. And Everything. That was, that was actually the follow-up question. How in the world do you measure yeah. your success? It's, uh, there's ways to do it. So mm -hmm. yeah, we have uh, quantitative measurement uh, sets, which is basically we ask students like Catherine every spring at the same time, uh, you know, a little bit less than a month after February break, we try to ask, um, actually, no, it's, it's more than a month after. So we March and late March, early April before April break is when we try to ask these questions because we ask about 30 day substance use, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be a snapshot of current substance use. So have you had a, a, a drink of alcohol more than a sip and for and non-religious purposes uh, in the last 30 days? So that's called the 30 day substance use mm -hmm. you know, data point. And then we'll ask that same question about cannabis use. Uh, uh, prescription drug misuse, painkillers, um, uh, tobacco, and or of the vape, vaping use, 30-day vaping use. So we have these 30-day questions. We have lifetime questions about lifetime substance use. We have a ton of social, emotional, skill questions around stress, anxiety, depression. Um, we have uh, one of my favorite questions is, do you have a, a, a positive relationship with at least one adult in the school? which is a really big protective factor. So if a kid says, yeah, I, and we have examples of how you would define, define that, that yeah. positive relationship in, in the question, but it's a yes or no question. So, uh, but, but it is a bit subjective because, well, I, you know, I, yeah, I have a relationship with every one of my teachers, they're great. Which well, is great because some students have no relationship with any of their teachers. So, <laughs> okay. And it, it's always yeah. subjective with yeah, that yeah, question. But yeah. the good news about teenagers uh, is that they're pretty consistently either honest or dishonest. So like we, whatever, whether it's exactly 100% accurate, our yeah. data, or consistently inaccurate, yeah. it's at least consistently whatever it is. It is what it is, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I love that question because it really sheds light on young people feel supported, young people feel seen, young people feel understood by at least one adult in the school community. That's not even a family member, right? And that's a major protective factor if you have that school connectivity. And so the questions it. like that. Yeah, and, and that's great because you get the the youth involvement, and um, and you're there's I guess you're you're a young adult now, Kathy. Yeah, big time. Um, but at the time you were a, um, a younger with your earlier involvement, and so but you uh, there's lots of others that are involved with this in high school ages, right? Yeah, in, involved with the program. And how, how is how is this received among students? This program, <laughs> right? Um, well, I remember because Paul used to like ask me if I get this question like sometimes like if we hear anything about the because we did what was our big one social norms campaign okay. which was um, I helped me make posters of like the the positive statistics of like, what is it, 80, 89% of students don't drink, stuff like that, instead of 11% of students do drink, just to like flip the, so I remember making those posters and then hearing kids talk about them in the hallway mm -hmm. and being like, oh, I just, I think a lot of kids didn't believe them. And I was like, oh, okay, very, like, I don't know, I, was, I felt like a rat, like I was like, I was like listening <laughs> in and reporting to Paul, I'm all, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there she is, avoider, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they didn't know you made them. Yeah, they didn't know I made them. So they put your name eventually. Oh, yeah. Designed by Catherine Mulcahy. But yeah. yeah, so. Um, thinking to give you credit, that's so funny. We did that to give you credit. Yeah. Not thinking, <laughs> oh no, we're outing her as like. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. It was fine, but it was, it was interesting to hear what kids had to say when they didn't. And I think it's received well, like the whole program. Kids try and, um, I don't know. I think, but I think getting, getting the students' buy-in, I mean, a genuine right. buy-in. It takes say, a yeah. while. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think that between peer pressure and being possibly perceived as, as a rat <laughs> or whatever, you know, <laughs> I know that that's certainly a narc. A narc. You, you could say, well, <clears throat> gee, I don't want to be that kid, you know. So I think that's the, obviously you consider that, and it's just a hard thing to work through. So it would be a gradual thing where you get so many people to step up, some of the young adults, teenagers, to step up and say, "Yeah, this is that important." You have to be brave. You I mean, have Catherine to be brave. Catherine was always yeah. brave, mm -hmm. and I think it helps to be brave when you have a good group of friends, basically, or yeah. peers that are doing it together. Yeah. So if you're all alone, 
that's, that's hard. tough. Yeah, yeah. If you're saying like, uh, I don't think we should binge drink this weekend. Yeah. That's hard. If ever, if it feels like everyone else is, you lose a lot of friends. Yeah, and that's you want to keep friends. That's terrible. friends is kind of everything in high school. Right. So, yeah, um, and the cool thing about the social norms, the positive social norms campaign that Catherine worked on, is that she took something that was really sort of hot button relevant as far as a theme. So mm -hmm. we took the Zoom classroom, which is what everyone was studying and learning on when she developed the campaign. And so uh, it looked like a Zoom call, the, the, the posters, but instead of students' images, it was all pets or animals because there's something that was sort of sticky or interesting about that for students. When they saw, so it's different animals, and then you named all the animals, yeah. really <laughs> funny <laughs> names. Uh, and then you use even the percentage, like, let's say it was a... 80% of students um, uh, do not use vaping devices mm. regularly or something. Um, so it's taking that positive normal behavior data point that we have and it's flipping the script for the youth population that's seeing it saying, well, I thought actually everyone was vaping mm. and it's not true, but it feels like it is. So you're starting to flip the narrative. You're starting to increase students' awareness of what the actual healthy normal behavior is. Mm -hmm. And then when we ask about this question every year, we ask about how many people do you think are vaping versus are you vaping? We always match those data points and see what the gap is in perception. So we're trying to close the gap in perception where majority of students think majority of students are vaping only 20% of students are vaping. So how do you close that gap to make it more close to reality where everyone is aware of, you know what, only 20% of kids are vaping. And so you're, that's why these social knowledge campaigns can be effective, but it doesn't work unless the campaign itself is interesting and provocative and, and, and inspires conversation with students. So you had different names, you had different data points, you know, 80% of students don't vape, or yeah, don't vape. Uh, I think she had eight pictures of animals and then two pictures of people that were like weren't online. <laughs> so even that was mimicking the data gotcha. point, yeah, things like yeah, that, just yeah. like all these little things. And then of course the, if it was a drinking data point, they were all having like, you know, substance free cocktails. So like there's a Capri <laughs> Sun that yeah, like yeah. a parrot was drinking. <laughs> so she just had a lot of fun with it. And I think it was really, really effective in getting students to it's talk just a, about. A nice yeah. creative way to get people's attention. Yeah, and yeah. it's, not, it's yeah. not a doomsday downer you know, mm -hmm. don't drink and don't drink, don't smoke weed. It's like yeah. most of us are making healthy choices. Just wanted to let you know. Yeah. Keep up the great work. And, and again, back to the 20, 80 percent. If you spin that 80 percent of the kids are not vaping. Yeah. There's the a different positive message. And yeah, we've had in, in my granddaughter, you know, uh, who's 18 now. And she's um, um, so I say, oh, everybody's vaping. Well, n n everybody feels like, it. It feels yeah. like it. <laughs> you know. So again, where that comes from, um, and of course, that's certainly a. And we talked to the uh, youth advisory board and some of the um, students there were talking about the vaping and how mm. that's concealed and how that's you know how they have the ability to conceal it. Yeah. You know, and that could certainly lead to, to other things. Um, what are some of the other um, effective programs that you find are working and making a big difference? And there's so much. Again, I go back to the website you've got, and so much information on that website is extremely well done. Um, but if, is there a standout um, program that you think is just working really well that's been more effective than anything else you're doing? What would you say? So you went to high school there for four years. What impacted your decision making around substance use that maybe the coalition had something to do with? Keeping in mind all the health and wellness classes, like we're, we work closely yeah. with the teachers, the health and wellness teachers. Oh, that is true. Because we, because, oh, we, we had, did, were you part of like? Did you make the junior year have health classes? Is that was that, that the? Because uh, we started counterfeit prescription drugs. Oh yeah, we, that's where you did. That we lesson. came well, in the for Narcan that. lesson. The Narcan lesson. Narcan yeah, they lesson was awesome. To do that. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, <coughs> we had our. When we have a health, there's like a health class. The health class, year, health class that didn't um, exist prior to, it, and then you, health you, class existed, but they had never addressed not for uh, juniors. Opioid, even. yeah, eleventh graders had okay. never really addressed opioid overdose yeah. response. Like, what do you do if you see someone mm -hmm. overdosing on mm -hmm. opioids, was, intentionally or unintentionally? What do you do? How do you respond? What does it look like? Yeah. What are the signs and symptoms of an mm -hmm. overdose? So that I was, came in and talked about that. That was cool because with every eleventh grade student. We were going to, like, a lot of us were going to college. Like, we're going to go to a whole new scene, see stuff we've never seen. Yeah. So he was like, you're arming us, like, with Narcan, like, telling us. Yeah, harm reduction yeah. strategies. Yeah. Like, if you find the, 
And even, I was talking about alcohol too with the Good Samaritan Law. A lot of teenagers, if they're at a party and they're concerned about someone's health, they're afraid to call, you know, emergency it, medical talk, services. A lot of people might not know about this, so talk a little bit about oh, the just, Good Samaritan. Uh, teenagers, just this, yeah. teenagers are not, if they're at a party and something has is harming someone physically, if someone's blacking out on something, it could be alcohol, it could be opioids, it could be a mix of whatever. A lot of teenagers are afraid to call law enforcement or call 911 because they don't want to be implicated or get charged for anything. So they're just like, I don't want to have anything. So sometimes they'll leave a situation. They'll leave a person. They'll, you can just get into a lot of risky situations. And so I was just letting every student I met with and their groups know, always call 911. You are not going to be implicated because of the Good Samaritan Law. So if you're trying to help someone out, uh, it doesn't you, implicate you. You're not going to be charged for anything. Yeah, yeah. You're trying, yeah, even if you have possession of a substance in small amounts, yeah. uh, if you are under the influence, does not matter. You're not going. That's not the point. The point is getting someone help, saving someone's life. Yeah, is certainly more important than. Uh, yeah, right. it's in the news every year. Some something. kid in Massachusetts was abandoned during some party, and there was too much substance use. They're in a field in the winter, and people forgot. Like every year, something like that happens in Massachusetts. You hear about it in the news, and that's all preventable. You know. Uh, Teenagers experimenting with substances is normal. Uh, it is not normal to abandon someone when they really need help. So, like, we want people to know that. And we want people to know that that's the healthy, normal thing to do is call 911. So we we talked about a bunch of different things in that lesson, but one of them was, like, counterfeit prescription pills. Yeah. Very, very, very important. This is not a great time to experiment with prescription drugs. It, it was less dangerous 10 years ago. Certainly, yeah. Now it's a totally different game. So I was... I was talking about that around when you take your friend's Adderall, it's not what it used to be 10 years ago because that Adderall might, for whatever reason, not be from a prescription drug from that kid's doctor. It might be from, it might be illicitly from the street and have some amount of fentanyl in it. So like talking about fentanyl, what it is, what it does, uh, talking about, you know, capital F fentanyl, you know, versus lowercase f fentanyl, which is you know, produced in China and distributed through cartels in Mexico. Like, students didn't know these things. So, like, we're trying to expose the risks of counterfeit prescription drugs. Very, very risky. Uh, and then uh, talking about the Drug Enforcement Agency's One Pill Can Kill campaign, which, you know, I'm not traditionally a huge fan of fear-based marketing with young people and substance use, but with with fentanyl, it's 100% accurate. You just need one accidental slip-up with a kid who thinks he's taking Xanax, and they're, if it's street Xanax, and it's counterfeit. It could be deadly. So, and even if it's in a bottle that looks legit, because sometimes you can just put it in a, and, and yeah. say, oh, this is, looks like a bottle I get from the local pharmacy. Yeah. So no, it might not be. Or xylazine, which is another very dangerous um, tranquilizer, tranquilizer yeah. that has had devastating effects as well. The yeah. fentanyl can kill. So I think that harsh, fatal warning is important. And yeah. you're right. Even though you might be not a fan of the fear, which I get, um, the well, it's real. It's yeah, we're real. sharing data <laughs> There's around. There's not much of a choice. Pills that have rec that were confiscated five years ago. How much of those had fentanyl in them? And compared to last year, you know, it's just an eightfold increase in how much uh, fentanyl is in pills on the street now. So we're just raising awareness for teenagers. Just this is not a great time to experiment with prescription drugs. If you're gonna use a prescription drug, make sure it's your prescription drug in the amount it was prescribed by your doctor. You know, mm -hmm. like really leaning into that. And then we, I would always also ask the kids, like, how normal is it to be prescribed painkillers with opioids from your doctors for knee surgery or oral surgery or wisdom teeth or whatever? And I'd always ask to see if, if you're comfortable, you can raise your hand. And tons of students raise their hands. And I always ask if someone's comfortable sharing, how many, how many pills did you get prescribed? What was the drug? Did you take it? You know, it's a very personal question. Um, and these are confidential, like, classroom right. sessions. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're sharing that with the public. But a, a student will always feel comfortable saying, you know, I was given, uh, I think, you know, six Percocet, which I'm like, that is very heartening. I, you know, I had oral surgery 20 years ago, 15 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. 30 Percocet out the door. Yeah. Way too much opioid. Oh, yeah. And I couldn't handle one Percocet, never mind 30. Like, it, it, my system didn't like it. So the fact that kids are being prescribed less by their doctors, which is great. So I'm just, like, taking a snapshot of that. But also I asked, you know, did you take it? How did it feel? What was it like? And then most kids are like, I didn't take any. I took Tylenol and Advil, and I alternated. And and I got like, through it, yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, the message is getting across to parents. And it students, certainly is, yeah. Which is good. I've I mean, noticed that, too. And believe me, I had a dozen knee surgeries. <laughs> and every single time early on, especially years ago, I would get that bottle of 30, 30 Percocets. Um, one summer I had a, an issue with that. I was living alone as many years ago. And 
I needed more and I was just depressed and it just didn't, it was fuzzy, you know, subsequent to that, I never had an issue with, but I get my bottle of 30 Percocets and I go, wow, wow they, how do I need this many? I don't. And now, then they went down to 15 and I think my last surgery, they gave me five, mm. which is fine. I didn't even need the five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't even have 30. to fill the prescription. So that's another thing students didn't know. Right, right. And so, yeah, there's, there's at least some recognition to, to lower that but it's dangerous because what would happen is somebody takes five of the 30 they have 25 left and what happens they're sharing it with their friends and getting other people hooked or you're just keeping it in your house for a rainy day which yeah. is a thing that people do and i get it because right. it's a pain in the butt to get a prescription filled. yeah right that's the number one reason someone's house is broken into is to look for drugs because they're incredibly valuable one of those pills can get you 25 to 30 i didn't know that is that the number one reason it's for money for drugs or for drugs for money gotcha so it, it's all about you know something valuable right and one of the most valuable things you have in your house is in your medicine cabinet you know if you have a bottle of 25 percocet that's worth i'm not great at math but that's worth a lot of money uh <laughs> Twenty-five to thirty-five dollars per pill. So you're thinking about My them. goodness. And you paid what five dollar copay? To yeah, something. yeah. So I don't think anything of that. So you got to get rid. You know, if you're not using a drug that you've been prescribed, you got to get it out of your house. Yeah. You can dispose of it in your own trash in Longmeadow at least because it's incinerated. <laughs> uh, mix it with something undesirable like you know, crush it up, mix it. Garbage with disposal grounds. maybe. Um, uh, d don't do that. Get it out of the water supply. So you don't want to flush it. And okay. You don't want to put it in the sink. That's it. See, I just trash. said that. I yeah. would have just done that. <laughs> Only because. It, the water supply needs to be filterable, right? And so, but when you have opioid, opioid is so strong, it's like almost impossible to get it out of the water. So once it's in the system, it's like well, that's incredibly a great hard to clean point. I never, ever thought about that. So how, let's go back because yeah. I interrupted you. Yeah, no. How would you best d destroy or, you know, um, get rid of? You can bring yeah. any unwanted, uh, unused or expired prescription drugs to a prescription drop box, which most police departments have them 24 seven available in the lobbies. You can just walk in. Uh, usually you have to talk to the, uh, the dispatcher. Okay. To unlock the box, just drop, you can have yeah. a whole bag of them, just drop them off. Uh, you can, we have two prescription drug roundup days nationally in October and April. So those are fun because you get to just sort of really spread the word, bring them all in. And you know, we collect 80 pounds of pills in one day, which is a lot of pills. Uh, and it's mostly for, you know, seniors who've yeah. passed or you know, there's just all this you. medication. People don't know what to do with. Yeah. And flushing it is the normal practice or yeah. it was. Yeah. And we're finding out now with these incredibly strong narcotics, that is not the best way to dispose of these pills. It's, it's, so prescription drop off days or prescription drop boxes. But what happens with those drugs is they get brought to the same place that your trash gets brought to and it gets incinerated. So your local trash, at least in Longmont, I, I believe a lot of local towns are similar where your local trash will be burned. It, at some local facility. Then, okay. So you can throw your, your pills away in your own trash, but they should be mashed up and mixed up with some undesirable So they're things. undetectable. But, but, or so just unusable. Right, right. You know, yeah, so yeah. like uh, uh, coffee grounds or something like that, mix, kitty litter, mixing it in with something that people wouldn't want to. Wouldn't, right. Get that. That's, that's great info. I didn't know that. Yeah. Learn something every day. Yeah, every yeah. single day, Mike. I'm here <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wow. Um, well, you know, there's so... With with all the work you've done, and believe me, I can see it. You've been with this now for seven years, um, and boy, I know you said your your life changed. You have two young children. At the time you joined, you switched careers, um, went into this as a program director. You had a young child about the same time, and now another child, which obviously is probably more of a concern to say, hey, you know, my children are going to grow up, and yeah, I got to keep things safe for them. But after all these years. Um, are you getting tired of it? Um, are you getting tired of it yet? Does it wear you out? Do you get exhausted by this whole thing? I, I don't get tired at all. I can't I, because you have the uh, great passion with this. But you know what uh, I yeah. think it is? It's uh, my distance from the from the subject, right? So I yeah. don't have teenagers. I'm not working directly with teenagers saying, uh, "Please don't use substances. Please do this. Mm -hmm. Please do that." They're not my kids, right? They're other people's kids. Mm -hmm. But my job is ta my I'm tasked with changing the environment that they grow up in, mm -hmm. which is a much more sustainable expectation of me as a professional. Because that's something you can just commit to long term and just chip away at, and it's not so emotionally draining. You know, like when we worked with the local health department years ago, and we we essentially made uh, like flavored flavored uh, vaping devices. We made them 
de facto illegal in Longmeadow by saying you can sell flavored vaping. You can't do this in the state at all anymore. But we were way at ahead the of the curve. Yeah, yeah. Saying uh, you can you can sell flavored vaping devices in your store in Longmeadow if you have a tobacco license, but it must be a twenty one plus establishment. Okay. And you can guess that there's no twenty one plus establishments in Longmeadow. So yeah, you know, there's no okay then. There's then. no capacity to sell it. So we yeah. you we couldn't make them illegal, but we could make them very hard Limited to sell. Limited to make it, yeah. And that's what we were seeing that students were using was flavored vaping devices. So like, how can we change policy locally to make mm -hmm. a huge difference? So things like that, like I don't lose sleep over those things not changing overnight. I'm not an emergency room nurse. Like I have a job that's reasonable, you know. So it's very my energy. My ability to commit to this work is much more sustainable than, you know, I was a high school English teacher right out of college, and I loved it, and it was so engaging, and I was just, I loved my 120 students, and at the end of the year, I'm like, I can't do this. You know, it's 120 kids that I want to connect with and really help grow from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and it kind of worked this year, but I cannot see this being feasible five years from now. I'm just not going to have the energy. So... I needed to find something, some way to find a way to support teenagers in their path to, you know, healthy development that wasn't so painstaking and, and arduous and and yeah. and <laughs> energy zapping. Uh, and so that's why I found my way to public health eventually. Well, I think that's great. I think that the town of Long Meadow is, is, is lucky to have you and and all you're doing. You're true. doing a great so job. True. Thanks. Yeah. So true. Thanks. Uh, yeah. See, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll mention again, it's closecommunity.org. Um, and there's so much to it. And I think there's a lot of a lot of towns and communities have some great programs and great websites and, and great information to share. But again, if, and if anybody's interested in learning what you guys are doing, I think you guys really have done it very well. So I encourage people to visit your website, closecommunity.org. And there's so much on there um, worth sharing. And that's why I'm glad you guys are here. Um, and before we wrap up, is there anything that uh, we forgot to mention that that uh, any aspect of this that you have that top of your head just spinning around waiting to talk about <laughs> <laughs> no other than Paul's doing a great it. job I'm dying to know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> how has your growing up in Longmeadow your okay. participation in Close and the work you've done with Close the 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 trainings you were able to attend in DC like how has any of that shaped your existence in college you go to a really great big <laughs> local university and you have a relationship with that school in that new environment so how how do you approach this new environment how do you feel in college as far as uh your decision making around mm. substance use friendships social s social skills stuff like that how's it going how are you impacted by your growing up in long meadow and participation in our in our program <laughs> Well, that's a great question. And there is a that's right a good answer. question. Yeah. I wish I thought answer. of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I hope you get this one right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of, I kind of feel like I, like I know what I'm doing. Like, uh, when, when it comes to like substances, and because that's such a big thing, at, like the big party school. Yeah. Um, you know, I know how to be safe. I know how to like. I know how to. I know to call nine one one. I, I haven't had that experience, but um. Well, actually, I did one time. I was driving, I was the, driving bus. the bus. <laughs> She's a bus driver at UMass. I did call 911 for someone, wow. but I wouldn't have been in trouble anyway, so it wasn't that situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, I feel like Long Meadow prepared me extremely well. Um, I am feel lucky to have grown up in a place that, yeah. like, uh, just it values that this, this kind of work because um, it just made it easy for me to, be in college. It's, it's giving make... you more confidence too, yeah. to work through these things, right? Exactly. Is it change your ability when you have new friends, new activities, and people, peer pressure? Has it armed you or enabled you to be able to stand firm despite the peer pressure you might get? Uh, yeah. I, I don't, um, I don't use marijuana or anything like that, especially because I'm a bus driver. You know, you know, a lot of the drug tests you. Um, so that's a real nice excuse I have for that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a bus driver. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to pass, <laughs> have to pass <laughs> on that. Um, so, I don't know, I kind of feel lucky to have that excuse. Um, I know a lot of kids, I don't, I don't know how kids, I guess they can just lie and say stuff like that. But I know kids do smoke weed. My, my dorm room 
always smelled like just just filled up. You just and walk in just and wafting, it's there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or my dorm building. Yeah. Um, Amherst so, in general. Yeah, Amherst in general. Well, there's a lot of dispensaries in Amherst. Yeah. There's zero in Longmeadow. Yeah. And it'd be very hard for a dispensary to open in Longmeadow because they didn't have a majority of people vote for the legalization okay. of yep, cannabis. Yep, so they'd yep. have to have a like local referendum, essentially. Mm-hmm. Which is a huge protective factor to have a community that's like, no, nah, we don't want that. Mm. Uh, and it's really easy for me to work with Longmeadow and cannabis because of that. But if I'm in East Hampton where I live, that coalition work is very different. Oh, it's very different. Yeah. More dispensaries in you know Northampton, East Hampton, gotcha. all of Boston. Yeah, that's a different challenge. Yeah, yeah. But I feel mm-hmm. like you even know, knowing that you know, well, that you want to drive a bus. <laughs> I just think you're a very special type of person <laughs> as it is, and I, that's a very caring, strong thing to do. I mean, you're quite a leader when you're driving that bus. Those things are huge. They're yeah. dangerous. There's lots of people that depend on you for right. so many reasons. But I mean, like decisions like that, I feel like you just go for it. And you don't have a lot of barriers stopping you from. Yeah. yeah. I think you you've been able to set goals like that and have aspirations and had a great attitude around mm-hmm. all of it. Yeah. Because of I think what you've gone through. Yeah, as that's, as that's impressive. And I, I didn't mention. Uh, yeah. So the town of Longmeadow, all these stressors and pressures. It's an incredible place for young people to grow up. You yeah. know, you have mm-hmm. so many caring adults. So many, like thousands of caring adults and parents and school staff and Big the schools sidewalks. are incredible. So like, there's an amazing reasons to for kids to grow up in Longmeadow and. They just saw there was a major problem. And so I think it's really admirable for a group of parents like that to say, this isn't going to be something we hide. We're going to try to put this out in front. And there's still lots of stigma, but a lot less now when people are talking openly around addiction and mm-hmm. and how families are struggling with it and individuals are struggling with it. And we're exposing, you know, that, you know, four years ago, 30% of the kids were vaping in the high school and now it's you know it's gone down 72% in four years because of the efforts of the school, efforts of the, the teachers and the parents and the students themselves trying to change norms. And I mean, this this data, you know, this, this work works and we can see it in the data. You asked like, how do you know if it's working? And our substance use rates have been just sure. dropping every year since we've started. There's been some blips like COVID. We, everything was plummeting because there was no social access. But post COVID, we were afraid of this huge rebound because you had all these like, people were stressed out, anxious, they were depressed, everyone was isolated, mm-hmm. and they were gonna rebound, right? And we saw a little rebound, but there was, you could see all this foundational work that happened pre COVID really made an impact on how things bounced back. And now we're still trending down. So from where we were years before COVID. So everything's just trending down and protective factors are trending up slowly. And then we, still or you know anxiety depression all going up stress going up so these are problems because these are going to lead to some problematic outcomes Mm -hmm. um and those are all going up locally and nationally and at the state level so like we're seeing teenagers are stressed out they're anxious they're depressed on levels we've never really seen this cohort of teenagers that are in high school right now are the healthiest group of teenagers in the history of america with regards to substance use so they're using less substances to deal with these problems right now i that's a trend i hope to conti- see i hope continue. i hope so yeah yeah well that is great uh, gosh there's so much and i'd love to there, there's other topics we could certainly dive in more maybe in a future visit if sure. you're willing yeah, to come okay. back yeah yeah what are you doing later today oh uh, yeah uh, uh i'm not <laughs> talking busy. to anyone <laughs> i've been quiet. talking all nice. morning but uh well thanks both of you for coming as paul mcneil and Catherine mulcahy we appreciate all the work you do at the close community and um Keep up the great work, and man, it's great, great having you both. Uh, appreciate it very much. You're yeah. welcome. All right, and we'll be thanks glad so to much. have you back soon. All right, and thanks everybody for listening. Glad to have you, and we'll see you soon.